Yes, it's a simple matter of contracting or expanding the money supply. Yeah, yes, of course. The Federal Reserve cured America's financial instability and monetary weakness. Gold suppositories? We don't live in a democracy, no. What we have is a system where it is almost guaranteed that our Prime Minister will be the leader of one of the two main parties who are almost indistinguishable from each other on policy. Our choice is between a pro-establishment Eton Toff and a literal Knight of the Queen's Realm. We are governed by a tiny few people who have enriched themselves to pharaoh-like levels of wealth, which they then, of course, hide in offshore tax havens. Since the financial crash of 2008, which they caused, by the way, they've almost tripled their already vast amounts of wealth in the following 10 years, and have made even more since the pandemic, while making the poorest in society pay for the financial crash that they caused with inhumane cuts to public services that they called austerity measures. If that's not bad enough, these people also own the media entire. Like I said, we don't have a democracy. What we have is an oligarchy, and they have rigged the entire system against you. There's a good old-fashioned word for people us. We call them suckers. And there are other people, people who stay up nights figuring out how to take away what they've got. As you see, the top hat is still worn, but today only by a few. We are at a historic turning point. Money as debt is a form of slavery. It's just, it's changed everything. Congress, in essence, has ceded total control of the value of our money to a secretive uh, central bank. I don't hang around trying to read the entrails of what some statement in the administration may say because it's our responsibility to make up our mind about these things. There is no other agency of government which can overrule actions that we take. Picture a party of the nation's greatest bankers stealing out of New York on a private railroad car under cover of darkness stealthily hiding hundreds of miles south. The key difference in, with the CBDC is that the central bank will have absolute control and also we will have the technology to enforce that. It was a secret meeting at the time. They told nobody about it. The details came out later. But this is the place where the most important people in the world first came up with the formal plan to create the Federal Reserve. This place is crazy. I have alleged that there is a money trust. The degree of control will be far bigger. In 2014, a Princeton study with a less than catchy name, testing theories of American politics, elites, interest groups, and average citizens, revealed via statistical analysis an ugly and uncomfortable truth. Analysis indicates that economic elites and organized groups representing business interests have substantial independent impacts on U.S. governmental policy, while average citizens and mass-based interest groups have little or no independent influence. On June 7, 2014, Senator Bernie Sanders quizzed Federal Reserve Chairman Janet Yellen on her attitude towards this Princeton study, which blatantly pointed towards America's descent into oligarchy. That's oligarchy, rule by a few, democracy among elites ruling the many as a collective. Madam Chair, um, in the U.S. today, the top 1% own about 38% of the financial wealth of America. The bottom 60% 
own 2.3%. One family, the Walton family, is worth over, over $140 billion. That's more wealth than the bottom 40% of the American people. In recent years, we have seen a huge increase in the number of millionaires and billionaires, while we continue to have the highest rate of childhood poverty uh, in the industrialized world. Despite this, um, as many of my Republican friends talk about the oppressive uh, Obama economic policies, in the last year, Charles and David Koch struggled under these policies and their wealth increased by $12 billion in one year, uh, despite the oppressive Obama economic policies. Um, in terms of income, 95% of no, new income generated in this country in the last year went to the top 1%. Now, a study which I've just introduced into the record uh, by two uh, professors uh, from Princeton University, Professor Martin Gillens and Northwestern University Professor Benjamin Page, basically suggests that while historically we have considered our society to be a capitalist democracy, we may now have entered into a phase where we are an oligarchic form of society. In your judgment, given the enormous power held by the billionaire class and their political representatives, are we still a capitalist democracy or have we gone over into an oligarchic form of society in which incredible economic and political power now rests with the billionaire class. So, all of the statistics on inequality that you've cited are ones that greatly concern me. And I think for the same reason that you're concerned about them, um, they can shape the, uh, determine the ability of different groups um, to participate equally in a democracy and have grave effects on social stability over time. And so uh, I don't know what to call our system or how to, I prefer not to um, give labels, but uh, there's no question that we've had a trend toward growing inequality. And I personally find it a very worrisome trend that deserves the attention of policymakers. Madam Chair, we're going to play a little game. I'm going to name an obvious but unfortunate facet in modern American society. And you, you are going to dance around it like it's a children's fun time happy game. Oligarchy, go. Now flash back to John J. McCoy who objected to this idea way back in 1959 when he and some 30 other CEOs, the titans of industry and foundation heads, all met privately in Avril Harriman's home with Nikita Khrushchev, then premier of Soviet Russia, who pointedly confronted them by saying, You rule America. You are the ruling circle. I don't believe any other view. According to the wise men, McCloy, whose resume included president of the World Bank, chairman of Chase Manhattan Bank, the Council on Foreign Relations, and the Ford Foundation, U.S. High Commissioner for Post-War Germany, legal advisor to I.G. Farben during the Nazi years, and assistant secretary of war during World War II, objected to the Russian premier's blunt assessment, retorting, judge for yourself, almost all the bills proposed by Wall Street are automatically rejected by the Senate. Disbelievingly, Khrushchev muttered sarcastically, it appears that I have before me America's poor relations. And their currencies are tumbling, in some cases to levels we've not seen since the Asian crisis of 1998. For example, Kazakhstan's Tenge currency fell a staggering 23% today. Now, in case you think none of this matters to us, it's worth remembering that developing countries contribute half of the world's income and for years have contributed 80% of all global economic growth. So, if they're poorer, in the long term, we'll be poorer too. Because we're all connected in a globalised world and there'll be less appetite for what we sell. So, how bad could it get? On May 6, 2015, it should be noted the European Commission launched the Digital Single Market, drawing ever closer together in the new digital space. 
On August 28, 2015, though not united in policy, multiple groups of grassroots activists staged counter-conferences at Jackson Hole during the Federal Reserve's iconic retreat to protest the central bank's dominance over the economy. Whether right, wrong, unqualified in economic matters, or confused, it is clear the populist contingent is aware of the major impact the bankers hold over their lives. Between 2014 and 2016, while all this other stuff was going on, the People's Bank of China initiated research into the development of an official digital currency. Its issuance and operation, first publicly announcing its plan in January 2016, and establishing a digital currency research institute in 2017 to test and fine-tune its blockchain-based currency, which incidentally fits hand in glove with China's social credit Seuss Valence Techno Panopticon system that is literally straight out of a Black Mirror episode. Specifically, China's bank found the use of a digital currency to replace cash prevented negative interest rates from being undermined by withdrawals of cash, something that's been on the Fed's radar as well. In February 2016, James Clapper, then U.S. Director of National Intelligence, echoed Petraeus testifying to a Senate committee that smart fridges and other appliances had backdoor capabilities. In the future, intelligence services might use the Internet of Things for identification, surveillance, monitoring, location tracking, and targeting for recruitment, or to gain access to networks or user credentials. Linked bank accounts and credit cards obviously top that list. May 2016, the World Bank reported on its new digital development partnership focused on making digital solutions available to developing countries, instituting a digital economy-enabling environment, internet access, cybersecurity, digital government platforms, and mainstreaming digital services generally. Along with a host of nations, its partners included Google, Microsoft, and GSMA Mobile. With a new tide rising, TED Talks promoted how blockchain will radically transform the economy. A talk given by blockchain disciple Bettina Warburg, incidentally named after the sister of Federal Reserve founder Paul Warburg. Blockchains give us the technological capability of creating a record of human exchange, of exchange of currency, of all kinds of digital and physical assets, even of our own personal attributes, in a totally new way. So I want to talk to you today about the future of our species, and really the future of life. We are probably one of the last generations of Homo sapiens. Within a century or two, Earth will be dominated by entities that are more different from us than we are different from Neanderthals or from chimpanzees. Because in the coming generations, we will learn how to engineer bodies and brains and minds. These will be the main products of the economy, of the 21st century economy, not textiles and vehicles and weapons, but bodies and brains and minds. Now, how exactly will the future masters of the planet look like? This will be decided by the people who own the data. Those who control the data control the future, not just of humanity, but the future of life itself. Now, why is data so important. It's important because we've reached the point when we can hack not just computers, we can hack human beings and other organisms. Now, what do you need in order to hack a human being? You need two things. You need a lot of computing power and you need a lot of data, especially biometric data. Not data about what I buy or where I go, but data about what is happening inside my body and inside my brain. 
As you surf the internet, as you watch videos or check your social feed, the algorithms will be monitoring your eye movements, your blood pressure, your brain activity, and they will know. They could tell Coca-Cola that if you want to sell this person some fuzzy, sugary drink, don't use the advertisement with the shirtless girl. Use the advertisement with the shirtless guy. You wouldn't even know that this was happening, but they will know, and this information will be worth billions. By hacking organisms, elites may gain the power to re-engineer the future of life itself. Because once you can hack something, you can usually also engineer it. Science is replacing evolution by natural selection with evolution by intelligent design. Not the intelligent design of some god above the clouds, but our intelligent design and the intelligent design of our clouds, the IBM cloud, the Microsoft cloud, these are the new driving forces of evolution. This is why the ownership of data is so important. If we don't regulate it, a tiny elite may come to control not just the future of human societies, but the shape of life forms in the future. In August 2018, Wired Magazine reported on Democracy.Earth, a project created to institute blockchain-based voting, paralleling new digital government platforms. The following month, Mark Carney as Bank of England governor published The Impact of Climate Change on the UK Banking Sector apprising the financial sector of risks during the transition to a low-carbon economy, noting that too rapid a move could materially damage financial stability. In October 2018, former Fed Chairman Paul Volcker bemoaned to the New York Times, The central issue is we're developing into a plutocracy. We've got an enormous number of enormously rich people that have convinced themselves that they're rich because they're smart and constructive. And they don't like government, and they don't like to pay taxes. We are at a historic turning point. You, young or not so young, doesn't matter, but bold entrepreneurs gathered here today, you are not just inventing new services, you are reinventing the history of money. You're drawing a completely new future, actually. And we are all in the process of adapting. A new wind is blowing, and it is that of digitalization. And in this new world, we meet anywhere, anytime, as they said. And surprise, surprise, the town square is back. Back on your smartphone. A world in which millennials are reinventing how our economy works, phone in hand. And this is key. Money itself is changing. And yet, change often appears daunting, unsettling, destabilizing, disrupting. Beyond regulation, should the state remain an active player in the market for money? Should it fill the void left by the retreat of cash? Let me be more specific. Should central banks issue a new digital form of money? A state bank token, or perhaps an account held directly at the central bank and available to people and firms for retail payments to each of you? Looking back to the crisis on March 15th, 2019, during his presidential campaign, populist icon Bernie Sanders summed up the sh** in a statement that was pointedly attacked yet proven totally accurate. Not one major Wall Street executive went to jail for destroying our economy in 2008 as a result of their greed, recklessness, and illegal behavior. 
No, they didn't go to jail. They got a trillion dollar bailout. And what we've seen most recently, not just the U.S. banks, but the European banks as well, is that they're not even subject to the same level of criminal law. Um, the policymakers' Department of Justice have decided that they will not and cannot indict these institutions, even when they commit crimes, because the presumption that they do so will bring them down and therefore bring down the entire global economy. Mr. Attorney General, what does J.P. Morgan admit that it did wrong in the settlement? Well, it packaged uh, loans that it knew did not pass its own stated due diligence test. They put them out there uh, to the market and said that they were perfectly fine when, in fact, um, they were not. Billions of dollars in penalties the banks are paying will largely be borne by shareholders and by taxpayers as the banks write off the fines as the cost of doing business. J.P. Morgan is paying up for the Bernie Madoff scandal. $2.6 billion will be the total bill. But if the bank is settling criminal charges, why? is nobody going to jail. It became a very, very big question. Why did no senior executives go to jail? Uh, the Justice Department, under Attorney General Loretta Lynch and the Obama administration, have created a new doctrine. It's called crimes without criminals. So to be clear, you're saying that J.P. Morgan's conduct here contributed to the housing collapse? Not only the conduct of J.P. Morgan, it was the conduct of uh, other banks doing similar kinds of things that led directly to um, the collapse of our economy in 2008 and in 2009. You, you take into account all factors. You take into account the, the legitimate law enforcement need to have deterrence and to holding people accountable and to bringing money back to victims uh, and to making sure that the punishment is proportional to what the conduct was. And when you're talking about an institution, we also have to take into account, as we're required to, potential collateral consequences, potential collateral consequences. Imagine individuals being able to get away from that. The Attorney General Eric Holder testified in March of 2013 to Congress that he was afraid to prosecute the too big to fail banks because it would cause economic disruption. Now I've been going after him in Newsweek for that and he has backtracked uh, but for months, an inspector general's report shows he claimed that they had gone after more than a billion dollars and over 500 people involved in mortgage fraud, which by itself would still be a drop in the bucket. But it turns out that, in fact, there were less than 100 cases involving $95 million, which really is a drop in a drop. And he kept telling this lie. And uh, so we, we also now have a government that does not go after people who are engaged in, in criminal frauds because they are considered so powerful that if they were prosecuted, it would damage the economy. My God. As of June 2019, seven years after reaching one billion users, Facebook, the social media giant, announced its intentions to develop a Libra cryptocurrency. In July 2019, TED Talk hosted an expert on what digital government looks like, with Estonia as a prime test case, where everything from taxes, voting, driver's license, bank accounts, and of course payments are all tied to a single, all-powerful digital ID. Virtually everything, she says, can be done online, including accessing medical records. Everything is confirmed instantly using your ID card and PIN code to create what amounts to a digital signature. The main way it protects digital information is with technology called blockchain. It's a way of decentralizing and authenticating data to prevent hacking. It's most famously used by the cryptocurrency Bitcoin. Estonia is the first country to use it on a national level. With any such system, security and integrity are key factors. The fact that the NATO cyber defense system has been set up in Tallinn is evidence of the security. And August 5th, 2019. Several years into a Trump-era trade war with China that includes strong tariffs against overseas imports, then Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin, also a Goldman Sachs man and skull and bones to boot, officially claimed that China was manipulating its currency. He said, quote, China has a long history of facilitating an undervalued currency through protracted large-scale intervention in the foreign exchange market. In recent days, China has taken concrete steps to devalue its currency while maintaining substantial foreign exchange reserves. In fairness, this is nothing the U.S. hasn't already done openly for decades. 
In late August 2019, the Fed's Jackson Hole Summit brought Fed Chair Jerome Powell and Bank of England Governor Mark Carney together, outlining challenges for monetary policy in light of global economic developments. Carney singled out the dollar's continued dominance in the global system. And most fundamentally, a destabilizing asymmetry at the heart of the international monetary and financial system is growing. While the world economy is being reordered, the U.S. dollar remains as important as when Bretton Woods collapsed. It matters less when the global expansions are relatively synchronized or when the U.S. economy is relatively weak, but when U.S. conditions warrant tighter policy there than elsewhere, the strains in the system become evident. And while everybody was busy focused on Greta having her childhood stolen at the U.N. Climate Action Summit, Nobody really paid attention to the fact that Mark Carney, governor of the Bank of England and frequent Bilderberg attendee, he pretty much goes every year, I think, also gave a speech at the Action Summit where he said, quote, a new sustainable financial system is being built that has the potential to amplify the effectiveness of climate policies of the government and could accelerate the transition to a low carbon economy. But, he says, the development of this new sustainable finance is not moving fast enough. And trust, the Bank of England is one of the most powerful financial institutions that exists. And they're saying the development of the new sustainable financial, you got to look past all these buzzwords and look at what he's actually talking about here. The development of this new financial system is not moving fast enough for them. All the, the same Mark Carney led a coalition of responsible bankers who manage more than $47 trillion in assets to pledge sustainable principles at the United Nations Climate Summit. Banks and institutions not living up to these, quote, voluntary standards face loss of reputation or worse, sanctions, denial of lending, and bankruptcy. And just like that, banks worth $47 trillion have adopted the new UN-backed climate principles to fight climate change. And it actually says, under pressure from investors, regulators, and climate activists, some banks have acknowledged the role lenders will need to play in a rapid transition to a low carbon economy. Because as we all know, mega banks always bend themselves to the will of activists. As Carney stated, the transition to a low-carbon economy will also bring its own risks and opportunities, reassessments of the values of virtually every financial asset. Firms that align their business models to the transition to a net-zero world will be rewarded handsomely. Those that fail to adapt will cease to exist. The United Nations incoming Special Envoy for Climate Change has a bleak message about global warming. Mark Carney says the financial sector needs to act more quickly on the climate crisis before it's too late. The Bank of England governor previously served as Canada's top central banker, and he will take over his new role at the UN next year. Completing his tenure at the Bank of England, that same guy then became the United Nations Special Envoy for Climate Action and Finance. Because in this crisis-filled world, climate action and finance are a package deal. Specifically, Carney expects the green economy to be a $3.5 trillion annual investment every year for 30 years. Meanwhile, that same month, the Federal Reserve quietly began its QE4 program, again using quantitative easing to purchase assets, which it unleashed in full force in March 2020 after a national emergency was declared for COVID. Good thing the Fed was ahead of the game, since the unexpected pandemic instantly wiped out 23 million jobs and shot unemployment above 14%, with lasting effects that are still being felt now. As of November 2019, Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell acknowledged that his team of central bankers were looking into a central bank digital currency, though he claimed it wasn't currently in development. A Coinbase executive immediately countered, calling for the private sector to develop America's official digital currency. In January 2020, Treasury Secretary Mnuchin declared that China was a currency manipulator no more, scratching them off the naughty list. That same month, on January 16th, 
Former Commodity Futures Trading Commission Chairman J. Christopher Giancarlo announced a partnership with Accenture to create the Digital Dollar Project. A wonderful announcement we made just a few days ago that we're partnering with Accenture um, on the Digital Dollar Project to look at and to start thinking through some of the challenging issues in the development of a tokenized form of the U.S. dollar. Right now, the dollar comes in two forms. It comes in coins, it comes in cash. What we're talking about is seeing if it's possible to develop a third form of the dollar, and that would be a digital form, a central bank digital currency of the U.S. dollar uh, that would provide enormous benefits, we think, in terms of lowering the costs, shortening the speed of uh, global transfer payments, but really bringing millions of people that are unbanked into uh, into the ability to participate in global markets. The dollar serves more than just U.S. interests. I think it serves global interests. It's not just a coincidence, but it's actually, there's a degree of causation in the fact that we've seen regional global markets develop into a, into a, a, a globalized market over the last several generations. And that's coincided with the rise of the dollar as the world's premier uh, reserve currency. On February 27, 2020, former Google CEO Chairman Eric Schmidt wrote an op-ed arguing that Silicon Valley could lose to China. Without an all-out effort by the U.S. to stay ahead of artificial intelligence, emerging technologies, and the values of a free society. He warned in part, Now we are in a technology competition with China that has profound ramifications for our economy and defense. Important trends are not in our favor. America's lead in artificial intelligence is precarious. AI will open new frontiers in everything from biotechnology to banking and is also a Defense Department priority. What we now know is that AI will be the basis of pretty much everything you deal with over the next five or ten years. It'll be present in your information space, it'll be present in your medical care, it will be present in how your car works. Over and over again, AI is going to be an essential part of the world and in particular the United States. Schmidt's op-ed served as cross-promotion for the in-depth March 2021 report he chaired at the National Security Commission on Artificial Intelligence, which bluntly warned, America is not prepared to defend or compete in the AI era. Americans have not yet grappled with just how profoundly the artificial intelligence revolution will impact our economy, national security, and welfare. Big decisions need to be made now to accelerate AI innovation. He went on to caution that China has already used AI as a tool of repression and surveillance, stating, AI systems will create new capabilities for state actors to target individuals with precision as well as numerous aspects of our society like cities, supply chains, universities, corporations, infrastructure, and financial transactions. Strong data privacy protections will be necessary to shield the U.S. from this new phenomenon. 就是你的便利和被监控的部分，它一定是会被让步的，因为我觉得我的消费习惯已经被培养了之后，其实我很难摆脱这样的更便捷的支付方式吧。The AI report's blueprint included a mandate to contribute to U.S. government strategy on a range of emerging technologies, including digital currency and other types of financial technology. With President Trump declaring a national emergency over the coronavirus on March 13, 2020, the U.S. and most of the world went into one form or other of lockdown. Academics almost immediately discussed prolonged restrictions in various scenarios where tracking data would command the basic activities of a free society, including contract tracing and digital passports. By July 2020, with people still wondering if they were for real about stay-home orders and mandates, with Face shields. <laughs> Klaus Schwab, head of the Davos World Economic Forum, had already published The Great Reset. Apparently, quite a speedy writer. Conceiving of a complete economic reset after the disruptions, including a new normal based around digital verification and online intermediaries for all financial transactions. The Fed's 2020 open market purchases added at least $2 trillion more to the books, and that's aside from Treasury's direct stimulus payments to individuals and relevant tax credits designed for relief. 
By October 2020, under the guidance of the Bank of International Settlements, seven central banks in North America, Europe, and Japan agreed to foundational principles for central bank digital currencies, emerging as general payment systems, while emphasizing the key function of money, trust. The BIS wrote, quote, Central banks have been providing trusted money to the public for hundreds of years as part of their public policy objectives. Trusted money is a public good. It offers a common unit of account, store of value, medium of exchange for the sale of goods, and services and settlement of financial transactions. Back to the fundamentals, because the transfer of energy through currency remains centered around trust. But what is considered trustworthy in the digital realm? With digitalization of all aspects of our lives, here we are virtually connected, accelerated today by COVID-19, once a boring subject, now it takes center stage in policy making. We've been engaged in a number of research projects. One set of experiments is being carried out at the Board of Governors here in Washington, D.C. Complementary efforts are also now underway. For example, through the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston, which in collaboration with researchers at MIT, is developing a hypothetical central bank digital currency. Partnership of the ECB with the Bank of England, Bank of Canada, and a special partnership with the Federal Reserve System, special partnership. We want to be a real catalyzer for action, a, a nucleus for cooperation. We need a lot of cooperation. We strongly support the work of the Innovation Hub, and in particular for the group of central banks around this EIS that we've been working with. I, I think if we think in the international dimension, uh, uh, the huge, huge challenge is to assure that the international uh, operability of CBDCs is a huge task. Uh, a lot of coordination, the new uh, dimension, uh, I think is huge and it requires to, to bring all the forces together. Yeah, there are many, many dimensions. The challenge is huge. And therefore, the effort behind uh, being successful will be huge, 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 huge. And therefore, we need to, to add uh, forces, all the forces in particular, uh, the concentration of central banks, forces, uh, dimension, many dimensions. Yeah, there are many, many dimensions. Dimension, forces. Um, uh, um, um, uh. Forces. We continue to offer strong support for the research efforts of the BIS. Innovation Hub. With digitalization of all aspects of our lives. Uh, so I'll stop there. Just around the corner in January 2021, the Davos World Economic Forum, temporarily virtual and distant, centered around, of course, digital currency. Davos formed a Digital Currency Governance Consortium, which sounds super, super official, composed of central bank heads and blockchain experts who held an obvious leaning towards central bank-issued cryptocurrencies, spun in discussions as stable coins, as in price-stabilized and mint-controlled. This contrasts with volatile market price Bitcoin, etc., whose soundness and issuance is verifiable via a proof-of-work ledger preventing double-spending accounting tricks, not a central mint issuing each coin on institutional faith. Big diff, in theory. I mean, both sides of these coins operate on trust, though, so... It's always all about that. The 2021 Davos Forum coincided with a new Bank of International Settlements survey on digital currency that found 86% of central banks were testing the idea. Multiple nations were already implementing some form of it, and perhaps 20% of the global population would be holding central bank digital currency within three years' time, which is a pretty quick turnaround. Moreover, the BIS formed a direct partnership with the central banks of Europe, the UK, Canada, Japan, Sweden, and Switzerland to unify their CBDC research. On March 24, 2021, billionaire influencer Elon Musk announced that Tesla would accept Bitcoin as payment, sending major bullish signals to the cryptocurrency market. 
In April 2021, the U.S. and IMF announced a joint effort to allocate more than $650 billion worth of aid to developing nations whose economies were negatively impacted by the pandemic, denominated in special drawing rights. The most recent and by far the largest allocation took place in 2009 as part of the response to the global financial crisis. Meanwhile, small investors and institutional investors alike were seeing huge gains and then huge losses in the private cryptocurrency markets as Bitcoin, ETH, and even Dogecoin went mainstream. And the world was shown how titans like Musk could influence billions in crypto markets with the power of just a few tweets. That one word sent Bitcoin and other major cryptocurrencies plunging. Musk later clarified Tesla has not sold Bitcoin. You know, it's okay when you're one of the world's richest men to effectively pay gains, I think, in the crypto space. For a lot of people that are investing, a lot of retail investors that have been pulled into the digital asset space, and as Bitcoin investors in particular, I kind of feel sorry for them. On May 6, 2021, CoinMetrics, a company self-described as organizing the world's crypto data, partnered with Goldman Sachs putting the managing director of Goldman's digital assets tasked with blockchain and crypto expansion on their board of directors. This exec revealed in 2020 that Goldman was exploring its own fiat digital token. History seems to be in the making. Two days later on May 8th, The Economist's cover story was GovCoins, the digital currencies that will transform finance. And it says, in tech we trust. The least noticed disruption on the frontier between technology and finance may end up as the most revolutionary. The creation of government digital currencies, which typically aim to let people deposit funds directly with a central bank, bypassing conventional lenders. Central banks everywhere are moving fast to institute a government-sanctioned digital currency before private cryptos can take serious root potentially undermining the ability of central banks to manage the economic cycle and inject funds into the system during a crisis. Well, a crisis for control freaks, anyway. Am I right? The Bahamas has issued digital money. China has rolled out its e yuan pilot to over 500,000 people. The EU wants a virtual euro by 2025. And America is building a hypothetical e-dollar. At stake is not just digital access and ease of payment, but a major threat to privacy and individual sovereignty. These GovCoins are a new incarnation of money. They promise to make finance work better, but also to shift power from individuals to the state, alter geopolitics, and change how capital is allocated. A decade or so ago, Paul Volcker, a former head of the Federal Reserve, grumbled that banking's last useful innovation was the ATM. Since the crisis, the industry has raised its game. Banks have modernized their creaking IT systems. Entrepreneurs have built an experimental work of decentralized finance, of which Bitcoin is the most famous part. Meanwhile, financial platform firms now have over 3 billion customers who use e-wallets and payment apps. Government or central bank digital currencies are the next step, but they come with a twist because they would centralize power in the state rather than spread it through networks or give it to private monopolies. Once ascendant, GovCoins would become panopticons for the state to control the citizens. Just think of instant e-fines for bad behavior. China's autocrats, who value control above all else, are limiting the size of the e yuan and clamping down on private platforms such as Ant. Open societies should also proceed cautiously. In tandem with state control is confidence. With GovCoin, your money would be guaranteed by the full faith of the state, not a fallible bank. That, and they will know literally everything that you buy or do with it at all. Now, in order to our analysis on CBDC, in particular for the use of general, to the general use, Uh, We tend to establish the equivalence with cash, Uh, and there is a huge difference there. Uh, For example, in cash, uh, we don't know, for example, who is using a $100 bill today. We don't know who is using a 1,000 peso bill today. Uh, A key difference with the CBDC 
is that the central bank will have absolute control on the rules and regulations that will determine the use of that uh, expression of central bank liability. And also, we will have the technology to enforce that, to enforce that. And that makes a huge difference with respect to what, uh, to what cash is. If a, an advanced economy issues a CBDC and somebody in a third country wants to, to use it, it requires, it will require the consent of the central bank of the residence of that person. Uh, therefore, the, the, the degree of control will be fa far bigger. The degree of control will be far bigger. In the same time period, China intensified its restrictions on foreign cryptocurrencies, banning Bitcoin and related financial services. In consequence, it crashed crypto markets even more severely and hibernating Bitcoin's rallying stock value even as popularity and utility grows around private cryptos. On May 13, 2021, Elon Musk, with uncanny sway over markets, reversed his support for Bitcoin, indicating on Twitter that Tesla would no longer accept it due to concerns about energy usage. And immediately the currency collapsed by 15% in less than a day. Weeks later, Musk again backed the coin, acknowledging green energy pledges and sending the stocks back up again. On June 9, 2021, El Salvador became the first country to approve Bitcoin as a legal tender and an official option for payments that is fully convertible. The president promoted the idea that it might be especially useful for remittances. That is money flowing back into the country from its workers abroad supporting family at home. We have a chance to improve cross-border payments with huge benefits, especially for many of the world's poorest people. Remittances still cost 7% on average, more than twice the target set by the UN Sustainable Development Goals. To what degree this signals a trend in the rest of the world remains to be seen. And on June 29, 2021, it was reported a new startup called WorldCoin, because you just can't even make this up, WorldCoin would be making worldwide rounds doling out universal basic income in the form of crypto to every single person on Earth. And all the recipients would have to do to receive their fair share would be to stare into a silver-colored spherical gizmo the size of a basketball and have their identity verified by having their irises scanned. Staring into the silver orb, which sounds more and more like a Twilight Zone plot crystal ball, with each new report we read and scanning one's eyes would supposedly ensure both the humanness and uniqueness of everybody signing up by generating a unique numerical code for each person to discourage scammers. Run by a 27-year-old former student of theoretical physics at the California Institute of Technology named Alexander Blania, project raised $25 million from investors and is backed by former head of startup incubator Y Combinator Sam Altman and LinkedIn founder Reid Hoffman, among others. A small beta test is currently being run on the orbs, but there's no word on how much crypto a person gets in exchange for their biometric data. That same day, Democratic Rep Bill Foster of Illinois, co-chair of the House Blockchain Caucus, told Axios that laws must be passed to allow federal courts to not only identify crypto holders, but to have the power and ability to reverse crypto transactions if needed. Uh, it's access to a, you know, a, a very heavily guarded key, a cryptographic backdoor, in essence, that allows them to cryptographically reverse transactions on the blockchain. Stating that crypto transactions should only be allowed to be pseudo-anonymous whatever that means in today's digitally run world. I think that uh, we're going to have to establish a wall between the, um, between the legal and the illegal um, you know, regimes here. That uh, it's, I'm, I'm not there yet, but there's a significant uh, sentiment and in, in increasing sentiment in Congress that if you're participating in an anonymous crypto asset transaction, uh, that you're a de facto participant in a, um, don't worry, that's just our, we're coming into session here. That you are actually a de facto uh, 
participant in a, in a criminal conspiracy. So by that logic, I guess that means that a bunch of people in Congress also feel that way about people out there who dare to still conduct their business with cash, that those people also must be participating in criminal conspiracies as well. <laughs> Bowing out of further participation on July 15th, 2021, Dogecoin creator Jackson Palmer spoke out on the uncooled downer note that has started to become increasingly apparent. Namely, that, quote, despite claims of decentralization, which, by the way, are essential to the promise and allure of cryptocurrencies, the cryptocurrency was in fact actually a business, quote, managed by a strong cartel of rich figures who, with time, have developed to include lots of the identical establishments tied to the prevailing centralized monetary system they supposedly got down to change. In other words, what Palmer's basically saying is, just because we have all this technology does not mean we've made much progress since the height of the Standard Oil Trust. As in, droves of closely linked mega investors are now undermining humanity's last hope to eradicate usury and establish a sound and fair monetary system online. Because as we all know, quote, managed by a strong cartel of rich figures, end quote, was clearly not the goal of decentralized blockchain verified peer-to-peer -peer currency. Because we're not supposed to just be replicating the Federal Reserve Central Bank control online. Like that was sort of, uh, kind of, uh, not supposed to be the idea here. On July 25th, 2021, the Wall Street Journal reported that U.S. population growth an economic driver, among other things, had ground to a halt. Births had peaked the year the financial collapse began in 2007, but never rebounded. Now, with the pandemic in 2020, half of all United States saw more people die than were born. A trend demographers say could continue, leading to the population shrinking for the first time on record. The trend isn't just happening in the United States, either. The entire system is on the cusp of a massive change. At this point, it will have to. We all know that credit score and credit systems, you gotta be able to like know the gains of that shit because that shit is a scam, right? Like, if you have no credit, <laughs> you can't get credit. And then you gotta go into debt in order to prove that you can pay the debt to, like, get good credit. <laughs> right? There's really no fresh start to anything. It's just like, no, can you ruin something in order to, like, gain it first <laughs> instead of just completely building from nothing? China State Council unveiled the plan in 2014 saying it would allow the trustworthy to roam everywhere under heaven, while making it hard for the discredited to take a single step. It's a plan to regulate business and citizen behavior with various incentive schemes. Each citizen will be tracked, rated, and then rewarded or punished by the government with the help of its high-tech corporate partners. Imagine a society where everything you do, everything you say, and everything you buy is controlled and evaluated by the authorities. In Wired's article, Inside China's Vast New Experiment in Social Ranking, the social credit system is described succinctly. For the Chinese Communist Party, social credit is an attempt at a softer, more invisible authoritarianism. The goal is to nudge people toward behaviors ranging from energy conservation to obedience to the party. Social credit scores Award or remove points based on behavior. It's big data meets big brother. This will be a world with no more personal experiences, only transactions for the social credit system. This knows every person, every bike, every car, every bus. That's because it essentially turns every public interaction into a transaction where points can be earned or lost. So now the government is tracking citizens' behavior from smoking on a train to jaywalking. If you do something bad, you get points docked. If you do something good and you happen to be spotted, you get a boost. Scores are docked for things like littering, a messy yard, 
Gossip, a person's reputation is scored on a scale of 350 to 950. The country already has an estimated 176 million cameras. Everywhere she goes, Oh Young How You is followed. What she buys, how she behaves, is tracked and scored to show how responsible and trustworthy she is. Yeah, yeah. They're going through people's chat histories, like on WeChat and stuff, to look for potential messages and stuff. How you, with a good score of 752, is okay with it. Most people are. Pushes you to become a better citizen. The authorities insist this program will allow them to improve security for citizens. A lot of cameras keep the safety. It's really good. We can accept it. Currently, the backbone of the system is a set of black lists. Reportedly more than a dozen of which exist at the national level. Thanks to advances in artificial intelligence and facial recognition. Punishable offenses include things like playing video games for too long or wasting money on frivolous purchases or posting unapproved thoughts on social media. Unapproved thoughts on social media. Coinciding with the coming central bank digital currencies are what appear to be soft versions of China's social credit system. At the end of July 2021, UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson ruled out a new national food strategy which called for a $3 billion tax on sugar and salt as a way to discourage junk food buying in the nation's war on obesity. Instead, a new plan was proposed to be launched in January 2022 which would require an app to track the British people's supermarket spending and award something called virtue points to people who buy more fruits and vegetables or low-calorie meals. Extra points would also be awarded for participating in exercise events or walking to work, things like that. Points could then be exchanged for discounts or free tickets to events. It's not a far leap at all to a full-blown social credit system, as pointed out by writer Ross Clark in The Spectator, with his response, we need to act now to block Britain's social credit system. Clark wrote, do we seriously want to be monitored like pieces of an industrial plant? It won't be long, of course, before employers started demanding their employees use the app and to see diet and exercise history before giving someone a job just as clubs and quite possibly pubs and restaurants will be obliged to check your vaccination status before letting you in, next they will find themselves forced to check our dietary history before selling us a burger and a milkshake. And of course, the National Health Service will be expected to use the app for rationing health care. Don't expect to be offered a hip operation until you've proved that you're leading a healthy lifestyle. There will be no end to this kind of thing if we agree to use this app. Just look at how we were fooled with CCTV cameras. If we can be said to have consented to their use at all, it was on the basis they might be used to solve serious crime. Yet look at them now. Programmed to issue fines systematically for the most minor offenses, like straying into a bus lane for a few yards, accidentally dropping a few crumbs as you eat your lunch on a city center bench. It is always the same with surveillance. Give authorities an inch and mission creep sets in at once. Real sorted. Just a few days later, on August 3rd, The Hill published an op-ed, Coming Soon, America's Own Social Credit System, laying out how our social betters in corporate America will attempt to force the most profound changes our society has seen during the internet era. Kristen Tate wrote, Young people cannot effectively function in society if blocked from using Facebook, Twitter, Gmail, Uber, Amazon, PayPal, Venmo, and other financial transaction systems. Some banking platforms already have announced a ban on certain legal purchases, such as firearms. The growth of such restrictions could create a system in which individuals who do not hold certain political views could be blocked from polite society and left unable to make a living. The potential scope of the soft social credit system under construction is enormous. The same companies that can track your activities and give you corporate rewards for compliant behavior could utilize their powers to block transactions, add surcharges, or restrict your use of products. 
At what point does free speech make someone a target in this new system? When does your debit card get canceled over old tweets, your home loan denied for homeschooling your kids, or your eBay account invalidated because a friend flagged you for posting a Gadsden flag? The creation of a digital dollar would put an exclamation point on a new social credit score. Working in conjunction with major tech companies, citizens not convicted of a crime could lose their ability to transact any business. In time, decentralized forms of money, such as cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin, may be the main means for dissidents to operate, as long as the federal government doesn't move to squash them. If the Fed and members of Congress are skeptical of crypto now, its use by political undesirables could lead to a furtive effort to severely restrict or ban these currencies. Cash, of course allows for anonymous payments. We reach for cash to protect our privacy, our identity for legitimate reasons. Imagine yourself purchasing, okay, frozen pizza and beer. Ooh. Now, surprisingly, consumers of frozen pizzas and beer, in my example, are associated with um, higher mortgage default than those who actually consume bro organic broccoli and exquisite wine. What can you do if you're really craving for pizza and beer and yet you do not want your credit score to drop? You're not going to go for broccoli. You will pull out cash. And tomorrow? Would a privately owned payment system push you to the broccoli side? Would central banks jump to the rescue and offer a fully anonymous digital currency? Certainly not, because that would be a bonanza, not for broccolis, but for criminals. But let's return to the trade-off between privacy and financial integrity. Can we find the middle ground? As central banks might design digital currencies so that users' identities would be authenticated through customer due diligence procedures and transactions recorded. By the but the identities would not be disclosed to either third parties or governments unless it was so required by law. Unless it was so required by law. So when I purchase my pizza and my beer, the supermarket, the supermarket's bank, their marketers would not know who I am. The state might not either, at least by default. But anti-money laundering and terrorist financing controls would nevertheless run in the background. And if a suspicion arose, it would be possible to lift the veil of anonymity and to investigate. When you buy it at the click of a button, you bank transfers funds to digital currency held at the central bank. In turn, the central bank immediately forwards it to the supermarket's bank, which would credit the supermarket's accounts. All of that in a split of a second. All nearly for free and any time. Do you see what just happened? The central bank is now the trusted intermediary. This setup would be good for users, bad for criminals, better for the state relative to cash, better, better for the for state, state relative to cash, While the coronavirus had already hit the U.S. prior to March 2020, many media outlets have generally pegged some time within the first week or two of March as the before time, before the closures and lockdowns, a time when life generally felt normal. On March 13th, former President Trump officially declared a national emergency. 
So it's not without interest to note that it was just 10 days later on March 23rd that the Banking for All Act was introduced into the Senate, which would create digital dollar wallets maintained by the Federal Reserve. The following day, an op-ed published in USA Today declared the Federal Reserve to be an unsung hero of the crisis that, quote, should be applauded for its efforts. <laughs> By April, media outlets were warning that China's central bank started the test phase of its digital currency. Fortune going with, China is winning the digital currency battle by a long shot, and if the U.S. doesn't catch up soon, it's going to lose the war. On June 30th, 2020, the Senate Banking Committee held a hearing on the future of the digital dollar. The digital dollar project is a not-for-profit effort to encourage public discussion on the potential advantages of a U.S. central bank digital currency, or CBDC as it is known. The project's recent white paper proposes a new additional form of money, a tokenized digital bearer instrument. It would have the same legal status as the dollars in one's purse, but on a mobile device and would operate alongside existing forms of money distributed through the existing two-tiered banking system and potentially be recorded on distributed ledger technology. We must future-proof the dollar today for a digital tomorrow. Doing so is in the national interest. That same day, the Bank of International Settlements announced an expansion of the BIS Innovation Hub with the establishment of new centers in collaboration with the Bank of Canada, the Bank of England, the European Central Bank Euro system, and four Nordic central banks, including Riksbank. The BIS announced it would also form a strategic partnership with the Federal Reserve System in New York. Then in August 2020, at the San Francisco Fed Bank, Federal Reserve Governor Lael Brainerd discussed the Fed's ongoing research in the development of a U.S. central bank digital currency coinciding with the announcement of the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston's multi-year research project with MIT to, quote, build and test a hypothetical digital currency platform. The following month, during a speech at the 20th Anniversary Chicago Payment Symposium, Loretta Mester, president of the Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland, noted, legislation has proposed that each American has an account at the Fed in which digital dollars could be deposited as liabilities of the Federal Reserve Banks which could be used for emergency payments. Other proposals would create a new payments instrument, digital cash, which would be just like the physical currency issued by central banks today, but in a digital form and potentially without the anonymity of physical currency, she added. This radical overhaul of our financial system would involve the creation of digital wallets for American citizens, which the Federal Reserve would then directly deposit digital currency payments into payments like the stimulus checks Americans have been receiving due to COVID. Despite appearances, the idea for FedCoin, however, is not a new idea, or even a reactionary one in terms of the recent pandemic or to counter Facebook's 2019 Libra cryptocurrency announcement, as has been suggested. In 2017, three Yale Law Center academics wrote a paper wherein they concluded a successful FedCoin would make banknotes, credit card companies, and Bitcoin obsolete while transforming the nation's medium for money. Two years before that, David Andolfato, currently the senior vice president of the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis's research division, presented the idea at the International Workshop on P2P Financial Systems in 2015. The second proposal, FedCoin, how would this work? Well, kind of easy, right? We got the, we got the basics, it's out there, public, in the public domain. The Fed could release a Bitcoin clone, a suitably modified. And the key part is that the protocol would maintain a fixed exchange rate between Fedcoin and the US dollar. Prior to that, in October 2014, financial writer JP Koenig was also discussing Fedcoin, pointing out in particular the Federal Reserve's special powers of creation and destruction, writing, there would be an important difference between Fedcoin and more traditional crypto ledgers. One user, the Fed, would get special authority to create and destroy ledger entries, or FedCoin. In his response to Koenig, Bitcoin Essentials author Albert Zmigleski added, If that were the case, we would be back to a centralized system, controlled by one entity. Why bother with the blockchain, then? But now that answer's been spelled out for us by Ms. Mester. With physical currency, the potential for anonymity still exists. In the world of digital currency, anonymity is no longer possible. 
it isn't just the ability in real time to track and trace all financial transactions, whatever, but the power to prohibit transactions for any reason should the Fed or the government so decide. On top of that, the Federal Reserve and government would be in control of the terms and conditions. Therefore, it would be incredibly easy to, say, place stipulations upon any monies received in the digital wallet if it is deemed in the public interest for any reason to do so. This is an incredible amount of power indeed. On January 14, 2021, the International Monetary Fund took a poll asking Twitter users, are digital currencies really money? An overwhelming 79.9% of the over 95,000 people who answered said yes. Three days later, however, the IMF took another poll asking, are central bank digital currencies really money? This time, less than 36,000 people responded, and a majority of them 64.5% said no. The question becomes, what is considered a legal currency? According to the IMF, to legally qualify as currency, a means of payment must be considered as such by the country's laws and be denominated in its official monetary unit. A currency typically enjoys legal tender status, meaning debtors can pay their obligations by transferring it to creditors. Therefore, legal tender status is usually only given to means of payment that can be easily received and used by the majority of the population. That's why banknotes and coins are the most common forms of currency. But in order for everyone to use digital currencies, everyone would need access to the technology that it would require. Not just computers or smartphones, but the digital infrastructure, including the connectivity, which is not something thus far that governments have been able to impose on their citizens. In other words, the government can't make people use smartphones and pay digitally for things. However, this whole thing got shaken up and thrown out the window in 2020. A couple of weeks ago, my cash was turned down at a business in Austin, Texas because they no longer accept cash as a payment, even though it says legal tender on it, and it's supposed to be the thing that we've all agreed upon in this society to use as money. They wouldn't take it. Restaurants in major cities are now requiring people to scan QR codes just to see the menu. And when restaurants were completely closed down back in April of last year, The only way to order food at all was by use of at least a telephone, if not a computer. And while the definition above is describing legal tender in an official legal sense, as we all know, there are other ways people have traditionally paid for things since the beginning of human time. The first kind of business was barter. A good stone cutter, for instance, might make a few extra tools and simply trade them for furs and other things he wanted. It was easy. There was no need for money. Even today, barter has its place. Today, people are being squeezed. Squeezed out of food, clothing, necessities, because of rising prices. It's been said that there are three things above all else that people allow to control them. The past, other people, and money. Money is modern society's main form of energetic exchange. It's a mutually agreed upon form of energy transference that we use to settle our debts with each other. And if everybody didn't agree or the majority didn't agree, it really wouldn't matter what the numbers and symbols on the piece of paper are We couldn't use it to pay for things if we didn't all agree. It's obvious society is going through a huge transformation. And it's 
interesting to point out that in this next phase, the physical instrument that we use will have evolved from something you can touch and hold in your hand to something that is the dictionary definition of imaginary and that it only exists in a digital space. So in this next phase, money itself as a physical object will disappear. It will exist in kind of a non-space that we've created known as online, which is everywhere and yet it's nowhere. For hundreds of years now, money has been intricately woven into our daily lives. The hope and promise of crypto was supposed to be a decentralized digital tool that could set people free from the financial slavery that has defined every other currency in known human history. With a central bank digital currency, holy freaking crap. It's scary what they can do. They can program that if you don't use this money by the end of the month, it oh vanishes. If you, you, because your social score is so low, you can't spend on this fancy car. You can't spend on this piece of art. You can't buy this other digital asset. You, because we think less of you, can only buy these certain things. We can program the money. We can surveil everything you do with your money, right? No longer, you know, can I hand somebody money or send somebody money? Gone. People in the past have put their energy, their belief, their faith in tyrannical emperors, popes, absolute monarchs, and dictators who wielded that power over their loyal subjects in terrific and terrible ways. The monetary system is ultimately fueled by that same energy, that same belief and faith, that same trust. Whatever the token is, the coin, the unit of currency, it is meant to be a trustworthy symbol of the people's energy. And now we're at a crossroads. Never before has our monetary system had so much potential for freedom on one side, or heretofore unimaginable control on the other. So I guess the ultimate question is how can we, the people who will actually use whatever the currency is, how can we ensure that we aren't just stepping into the latest technologically evolved form of financial slavery? That's the question.
now spun the money, now what done? Spun the money, ha ha. Spun the money, go now what done? Now spun the money. Oh, spun the money, go now what done? Spun the Great your potato. I'll grade your potato. Put a little piece of pumpkin in it, it's gonna make it yellow. Love, girl, love. Love, girl, love. Love, girl, love, girl. Spunge your money. Ah! Spunge your money, now I'm done. Spunge. Oh, mama, go spunge your money, go now I'm done. Hey, I know you like it. Oh! Money gone, now I done, spongey money. I went down to town the other day, spongey money. I see all them boys getting bouncy, not spongey money. What I call my bunny gets five dollars go on the trip, not spongey money. Oh, mama gonna mama, 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 mama gonna spongey money. Love, girl, love, love, girl, love, love, girl, love, girl, sponge. Oh, sponge your money, go now I'm done. Oh, you're going to Nara. You're going to Nara. Oh, you put one half a yard in it, gonna make it wider. Oh, sponge your money, go now I'm done. Sponge the money. Oh, mama, 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 go sponge your money, go. La ni ni la 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 Love, girl, love, love, girl, love, oh, love, girl, love, girl, sponge, I sponge your money, go now, I done, oh, sponge your money, go now, I done, oh, burn your money, go now, I done, oh, grate your potato, grate your potato, put a little piece of pumpkin in it, gonna make it yellow. Oh, spoil your money, go now, I don't. <laughs> hey, la, 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 I'm going, I'm going, I'm going, I'm going, la, 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 Just a minute, just a minute, before you go, can I come with you? Won't you be my neighbor? Please? 